Thank you for attending our second lunchtime lecture series this fall semester. Today is Wednesday, October 6, 2021. I'm Jaime Correa and I'm the new director of the undergraduate program, an assistant professor in practice at the School of Architecture. And this semester, I'm also a faculty in residence, our Rome program, where it is now 6 p.m and 65 degrees. As you know, our School of Architecture has a robust lecture series that includes the Technoglass lecture series on Wednesday evenings. Tonight, there is one at 6.30 p.m. And there's another series, which is what our Dean calls the current lecture series on Monday evening, evenings or as needed and the lunchtime lecture series, which this year will be highlighting published work and scholarship in three sessions, but by five of, of our faculty members. Today, I am pleased to present two of my dearest colleagues, Edgar Sali, Sarli, and Stephen Fett, with whom I have had the pleasure of sharing studio assignments and doing professional work all over the world. Edgar Sarli is an assistant professor in practice at the School of Architecture of the University of Miami. He received a master's degree in architecture and, and in, in urban design from Harvard University in 2003. After collaborating with the office of Rafael Moneo for five years, he founded his own firm in Miami called Loeb Sarli Architects. And this office has won awards in Switzerland and Spain, and its work has been featured in AV, Domus Web, and NZZ. It has been exhibited in America and Europe, including the Biennale in Venice. And Professor Sarli is a Florida registered architect and teaches building technology, design, and visual representation. Steve Fett, He's a full-time lecturer at the University of Miami School of Architecture. He received a bachelor's degree in architecture and from uh, University of Minnesota and a master of architecture and a master of urban design at the University of Miami. Steve is also a licensed architect and the founder of his own architectural design and planning firm, Steve Fett Architects. The firm has won numerous and important awards, including the Florida Redevelopment Association's President Award and the American Public Works Association's Public Work Project of the Year for the three plazas and the complete redevelopment of downtown Lauderdale by the Sea, a project that he co-authored with me and which we continue working together. Steve is a regular contributor to a School of, uh, of Architecture Open City Studio Program in Tokyo and a valued member of the Center of Urban and Community Design. Please welcome Edgar Serley and Steve Fett in their book and research work on the drawings of Coral Gables and Rome by former professor Thomas A. Spain. Thank you, Jaime. Um, good afternoon, all. Thank you um, to many friends and family who have joined us today to see this lecture. For those who are here in person, thank you for making the time and those via Zoom as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean L. Curry, for being a constant support during the process of making the book. Um, and Jaime, thanks again for giving us this platform to be able to uh, share some of the work of Tom uh, and his art making. Um, Tom is here with his wife, Donna, um, via Zoom as well. So we're delighted to see him. And finally, uh, you know, big thank you to George Hernandez, who is a great contributor to this to this book as well. Um, this this lecture is meant to summarize the book and shed some light on the uh, artistic process of Tom's art making. A second lecture is provided in the back of the book by George Hernandez. His lecture focuses on other drawings with an interesting perspective, placing Tom within the broader context of the history of art. So if you have the book, you can enjoy that as well. 
Um, as I mentioned, I'm here, uh, as Jaime mentioned, um, I'm here today with Edgar Sarli, the co-author of the book. He and I were fortunate to spend a good deal of time with Tom while making the book, uh, sharing many afternoons on his porch and later his patio, discussing art, architecture, and the way Tom sees and approaches both disciplines. We will be switching between direct quotations for some of the essays and the interview in the book, along with more extemporaneous commentary, which I think you'll experience more when Edgar comes up to, to speak. And as we speak, we recommend getting lost in the art shown on the screen. There's a lot of depth and intrigue. It should certainly keep you entertained. I'll begin. Parts of the book, including portions of the interview, focus on the history and academic environment of the University of Miami School of Architecture, where until 2015, Tom had been a faculty member. Especially known on campus for his drawings of Rome, through his almost yearly visits spanning 25 years, Spain's extensive and brilliant collection of work focuses on memorable locations revisited and redrawn over the years. The work demonstrates how time and acute observation lead to new ways of seeing while revealing the circumstantial relationship between author, subject, and medium. Outside the classroom, Spain's fine art series is the architect's most labored and personal work. It focuses on Coral Gables, Spain's home, Developed by George Merrick in the 1920s, Coral Gables is a visual paradise full of lush landscapes of banyan trees juxtaposed with pioneer architectural monuments. Spain alternates between pencil, watercolor, pastel, using the unique characteristics of each to establish mood and artistic intent. The common thread of the work in the series is the contrast between the natural landscapes and the man-made landmarks that define Coral Gables. Place powerfully informs the work as the intense skies of South Florida are beautifully rendered through soft edges and deep shadows. Unexpected attention is given to the utilitarian parts of the buildings contrasting with the more recognizable front facades resulting in provocative idealized compositions. These two subjects, Rome and Coral Gables, became the primary focus of our book and, we will, and, and will also be what we will discuss in greater detail now. <clears throat> Perhaps Spain's most prolific work is of Rome. In his time spent in the Eternal City, he helped countless students improve their drawing skills and their abilities to observe and record the Roman landscape of monuments and ruins. Many of you in the audience may have experienced this. Um, it gave him time to draw and paint on his own, slowly amassing a stunning collection of pieces that when seen collectively, tell us the story of the city in his time, just as the great Vedutes, Falda, Vasi, and Gian Battista Piranesi did in theirs. It is the work of Piranesi that most influenced Spain. Piranesi, himself an architect, worked in a time when papal commissions were scarce and Rome was waning as a dominant political force. Piranesi's Rome is simultaneously glorious and deplorable. The monuments were overscaled for effect, recalling the grandeur of the past, but the years of neglect were also shown. The ground planes revealed the reality of the time, full of trash and vagrancy. In Spain's drawing, the ground plane is curiously omitted. The station points in his perspectives are intentionally low. This has two consequences. First, like Piranesi, it creates an impression of Rome as being larger than life. This may be inaccurate technically, yet appropriate symbolically. Second, it allows him to remove the clutter of everyday life on the streets filled with overflowing trash cans, menu placards, and double-parked motorinos. 
The reasoning behind Spain's selection of subject matter in Rome might be understood through the words of Aldo Rossi in The Architecture of the City. Rossi suggests that the manner in which history speaks through the arts is by way of its monuments, its willed expressions of power. The past, he suggests, is our collective memory and monuments mark history and provide order to the city. A city's past can be remembered through its monuments. Rome is, by extension, perhaps the most memorable city in the Western world. Long walks through the city at night are episodically halted to admire these monuments seen countless times before. Spain captures these moments in time by spending hours sitting on top of steps of neighboring buildings, propping his back up against stone walls, looking carefully as each subject reveals more hour after hour, year after year. Spain describes his approach to drawing Rome as still life. By removing the ground plane, he allows himself to arrange the buildings slightly, just as an artist would while drawing a bowl of fruit. He therefore can manipulate the composition to enhance the visual experience and capture, capture the emotion of being there. Over the years, he has drawn the same subjects differently with different media in different light. Five weeks in Rome, the typical residency by faculty is bittersweet. It's long enough to establish familiarity through routine, but too short to ever remove the fleeting sense that it will be over all too soon. Spain's drawings come from this reality. Spain is also influenced and seduced by the challenge of drawing technically difficult things. Spain's drive is to document the architecture of Rome with incredible detail and precision. This informs his own architectural vocabulary while, and understanding while simultaneously challenging himself to accurately represent the many complex geometries and rich surface textures found in the heroic monuments of Rome. Through careful examination of Spain's pencil drawings, one begins to understand the appropriateness of categorizing these works along with several others as part of a masterpiece collection. Persistence, passion, and the self-described stubbornness of Spain collectively contribute to his success. This approach and mindset is manifest in his work and is ultimately the legacy he leaves behind to the many students he has taught in Rome and to the countless others his art continues to inspire. Tom Spain's adopted home, Coral Gables, has proven to be one of the, his most fruitful sources of inspiration. It is in his series of partially real, partially imagined views, those who he refers to as fine art pieces or caprichos, where the, work, the work's ambition goes beyond capturing a place's formal, textural, and plastic presence to become fertile ground to explore personal views on history, ecology, architecture, urban growth, and society. Contrary to Rome, where his curious eyes are almost exclusively drawn to the magnificent monuments of the city, in Coral Gables, Tom's attention is drawn to the ex extraordinary as well as the mundane. He reveals secrets and tells stories, canonical, fragmented, and sometimes unexpected views of Coral Gables are rendered as stage sets where the theatrical nature of life unfolds a palm frond waiting to be collected, a veil shown here from a rained out quinceanera, a wrinkled paper bag, a ladder, a chain link fence, all generic objects that in Spain's daring compositions assume predominant roles and could be understood as protagonists in a frozen in time play. The dialectical relationship of subjects drawn creates a high degree of tension that sets up a unique tone for the author's communication with his audience. Tension, ambiguity, and of course, his technical prowess are a few of the constituents of Spain's method to engage through his work the most creative corners of the observer's mind. 
Family portrait shown here reveals Spain's literary inclinations. It commemorates important events in the life of George Merrick. In it, an empty chair mysteriously appears. Behind it, Merrick's childhood home peacefully rests under Coral Gables' warm afternoon skies. The chair is central to the composition, but its lower half is cut off from the frame. The scene is set right before or after the Merrick family would have been photographed. No family member is drawn, yet their presence resonates. A series of more recent drawings, landscape workers, builders, pipe, and houses, reveals Spain's interest in realism and social issues. Spain's builders are not only acknowledged by their utensils and the mark of their work, but themselves are absent. The setting continues to be Coral Gables, but in this case, there are no monuments. The actual workers who beautify the city on a daily basis are the celebrated ones. Spain would humbly argue he has never drawn a single figure in his entire life. Yet through bold composition and strategic omission, he is able to represent a collective and its essential contribution rather than the individual and its ephemerality. Coral Gables and Tom Spain constitute an outstanding duo. It is here where his work reaches its highest level of sophistication. Besides achieving the impossible with graphite and pigment, a carefully calibrated balance between commentary and documentation transforms the drawings into valuable cultural artifacts. If in the drawings of Rome, Spain is dialoguing with the city in space and throughout time, in the Capriccios, the dialogue is unequivocally with the audience. Understanding the pieces requires involvement, curiosity, and time. A masterful dance of the eyes is choreographed on the surface, allowing the meaning of each piece to slowly unfold. Calibrated between a calibrated balance between commentary and documentation transforms the drawings into valuable cultural artifacts. If in the drawings of Rome, Spain is arguably dialoguing with the city in space and throughout time, in the Caprichos, the dialogue is unequivocally with the audience. Understanding the pieces requires involvement, curiosity, and time. A masterful dance of the eyes is choreographed on the surface, allowing the meaning of each piece to slowly unfold. Now I'm gonna turn the uh, lecture over to Edgar Sarli, who will uh, begin to unpack some of the drawings more specifically, uh, casting a sort of broader, wider net onto uh, the world of art as well. Here's Edgar. Um, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Steve, for, for this uh, first part of the lecture. Thank you, Jaime, for your generous introduction. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dean El Curry, for your support through the project, as uh, Steve had mentioned, and all of you who were able to join us today. What I would like to do now is to invite you all to take a close look at uh, a brief summary of aspects that distinguish Tom's work by referring to points that he made during our interview. The work of a great artist holds its own weight by itself without the need for written or oral explanations. And that is certainly the case in Tom's work. On the other hand, the complexity throughout his entire career can be more easily unveiled by being allowed to enter the world of thoughts references, reflections, he seems to be processing while conceiving and executing work, but also uh, during regular hours. It seems after having spent time with Tom uh, during the project, interviewing him, that the brain is constantly processing information, references, and eventually all of those become fundamental parts of the 
the art pieces. My favorite part of this book is the interview. Uh, it is exactly that. It's a door opened into Tom's thinking process. A very rare opportunity because Tom, as uh, we have gotten to know him through the years here as, as students, then colleagues eventually working on a, a project of this uh, scale with him, it's uh, a person that prefers to communicate through graphite, pastel, watercolor rather than words. Uh, but during the uh, interview, we were not only impressed, but extremely surprised by the uh, amount of uh, information that he is processing and distilling while producing his pieces. If you read the interview, you would find uh, a wealth of knowledge that directly relates and explains some of the mysteries of his work. And in turn, I believe one would be able to enjoy the work in a more profound way. So um, wh what I'll do is because there's no way we can encompass so much in, in a brief presentation here is to, to take some quotes from the interview that are relating to the work and um, hoping that some of you would be intrigued to read further uh, into this, I would say, uh, extraordinary interview, obviously not because Steve and I conducted it, but because Tom seems to have been working for decades uh, on, on these ideas and the depth of, uh, and the layering of information, it's uh, quite impressive. Um, so we, we would sit down on the porch and we would randomly discuss anything that would come up to the table. Uh, what is printed on, in the book, it's not heavily adapted to the printed format. It's a rather honest, uh, transcription of the recordings. So uh, if you read it, you are almost exactly reading Tom's words as they came out during the discussions. But one point we were talking about composition and he brought up Moneo by the, the time of uh, his studies at Harvard, he said Moneo in a lecture, composition is nothing. And I almost jumped up, I couldn't disagree more. This is a, a bit uh, a way to, to understand the tenacity of, of this artist who's very committed to the work and to his own ideas and agenda. I think composition is everything. I think it's almost everything in life, frankly. For me, it can generally be broken into two parts. First, the selection of the parts. It's like making a movie, writing a story, making a building, making a drawing, or in fact, having a life. Uh, first you choose the, the parts and then you assemble them. So composition is at the core of the work. And during our discussions, we were trying to, to get closer to his process, asking if he would measure, if he would preconceive uh, certain compositions based on, on geometrical rules, golden sections, squares, uh, it all comes down to uh, empirical findings. You know, he starts sketching rather than measuring and, and laying out organization lines on the paper. He would just sketch. And uh, uh, we can see here that despite the fact that he would not set up um, a drastic drafting board to come up with a composition, it's rather clear that uh, his architectural background doesn't uh, escape for a moment. And we start to see squares and, and triangles and, um, and different tools that we would tend to use, at least when drawing used to be done by hand, um, setting up a drawing. Nowadays with the computer renderings, you know, setting up cameras is slightly different process, but I would still urge those of you who are students who work on the computer to, to think about composition beyond what the computer allows you to do in a simple uh, setting of a camera. So 
um, he, in his mind, if he could summarize, he thinks that, I think what you're doing, I quote, when you're composing is manipulating the way an image is con consumed. You're moving people's eyes in a particular way. And I think the best paintings are those where your eye does a kind of dance over the surface of a painting or space. You move from place to place, you make long moves, you make short moves, you stay in one spot longer to consume more detail. But in the end, the best paintings are very much like a dance. Now, this uh, understanding of composition as a tool to uh, manipulate an audience, and I say manipulate obviously in a positive way, uh, and how one would be consuming an image, I think it's uh, not only remarkable because he would think about it, but also achieve it. But I would say uh, relevant to underline for those of us who are indeed concerned with the visual world, you know, as architects producing drawings and buildings uh, for, for our cities. Uh, but in this case, you know, if I start to look at the painting, uh, it's watercolor, June, June 6, 1928, rather, um, is the title. Um, it's, it's another one of those instances where the main character of, of this painting, at least uh, if one understands the, the, the narrative behind it, is jo George Merrick. This is the date when, when Merrick was um, removed from the commission and his belongings are humbly set on one of the corners of the loggia waiting for him to be to pick them up um, so merrick is not in the picture but he is part of the narrative of the painting and then the composition starts to allow us to make a dance around the canvas right we have a very sharp one point perspective that seems to be, be uh, defining a square in the composition by the location of the vanishing point. The tower on the left, it's also aiming to pierce the boundary of the, the image, defining another square on the right. Um, so those could be arguably two static forms, but the sharp diagonal that the, the loggia is imposing on the page makes us to look down on the page where we now find to the right a winter sky although the title of the painting is june 6 tom talked about this sky as a winter uh, south florida sky with the warmth of the sun uh, so at that moment our eyes are displaced from the two-dimensional plane taken deep into the horizon to then come back to find the tower and the clock tower that starts a rotary movement um, to then find a palm tree that has a very strong horizontal line pushing down. So our eyes, as we are browsing through the painting are again, as uh, he aimed, choreographing a dance, uh, a very, uh, I would say, pleasurable experience to be able to spend time with these paintings. One thing that a project of this caliber uh, allows one to do is to really spend hours with each one of these drawings, trying to come up with interesting questions to the author, to find new readings for the paintings. And indeed, uh, the more one looks at the work, the more one finds. And I think that's perhaps an anomaly uh, in the recent uh, past, in the recent production of images. Um, I have a strong, I quote, I have a strong bias towards triangular dance patterns. If I am doing it right, there are three focal points. That's my intention. I want to move your eye in three ways, from spot to spot, and then you sort of move out into the details. But for some reason, I rarely pull it off. I don't know why, it just doesn't happen. But that is always what I mean, what I want. I like to sort of stretch those triangles. So the triangular uh, compositions, the uh, multifocal points in the images uh, are 
indeed uh, another way to to put Tom's work in in the, a larger context of image production. Um, you know, the work is extremely academic. Is uh, you know, each painting comes from a distant past and is distilled through his uh, utensils and and creativity. But the references to Caravaggio are coming back often. He will also talk about the Dutch masters of the 17th century. Uh, but uh, I, I would say, uh, in, in my mind, the fact that he spent so much time in Rome, it's uh, obviously uh, enough to, to confer that he has been looking at these paintings quite closely. And you know, the, the cross in, in the crucifixion of St. Peter is very uh, uh, dynamic. Those who are crucifying St. Peter are pulling up and down. So there are a number of forces that are all collapsing into this two-dimensional plane uh, in the hands of Caravaggio. And also in the hands of, of Spain, uh, we start to find so dynamic, provocative, you know, I would say uh, intriguing compositions. You know, there, there's a great deal of movement in the paintings that requires time and, and I would say careful attention. So uh, just slowly moving uh, into a, another topic of discussion, we have one of the, I would say, the most uh, significant pieces of, of work in the book in the hands of Tom Spain, because in, in my mind, and we spoke about this with him, this starts to suggest uh, an interpretation of Miami, of, of Miami's urban reality. You know, this juxtaposition of, uh, in a way, undefined grids and episodes. You know, we're here at the moment where Coral Gables is offering an entrance facing uh, 8th Street with its, with its life and its colors and its, uh, its uh, signs and traffic. Uh, so we are in a very special moment here in the city where Tom is able to put the monument on the background, compose an image that has, dedicates most of the, let's say, graphite to the rendition of a paper bag. And... Uh, and as he said, you know, if, if you were to look at the great painters, they all will always uh, make subtle shifts to create more interest in the composition. He's not interested in perfectly composed image. He likes to think more like a painter that would always look to compose and then revisit, perhaps question or destroy preconceived notions of composition. So he, they don't want them to be 100% composed. They will kick them out of balance and give you a little surprise. It's one of the reasons why I will occasionally push everything close to an edge. Uh, and you know, it end up, uh, the end result of, of this manipulation of, of elements of the parts of the painting here or the drawing rather, uh, we can see a heavily charged two-dimensional plane on the left. Uh, all the graphite goes there. The weight of the paper on the right counterbalances it. Uh, but we see that the paper bag that is lying on 8th Street has almost two or three times the size of the Granada entrance in Coral Gables. Um, he's obviously inclined uh, to beautify the mundane, the everyday life. That's a recurring pattern in the work. Um, I would say that by, by this composition that in the location of the Granada entrance, one could not seem to enjoy more uh, that drawing of the Granada entrance. If it were larger, it would actually perhaps be less successful. So this juxtaposition of the mundane, the monumental, uh, I think speaks of Tom's work, but I would say it starts to represent a map of Miami. Miami is a city of abrupt transitions, 
some oftentimes undesigned and randomly happening. And this is an example that I think illustrates more corners of the city where we live. Um, there are a number of sub chapters in the interview. Texture and references is one of them. Composition, School of Miami, the early days of the School of Architecture here is the opening chapter. I, I would say that those of you who are teaching here, studying here are probably interested in understanding what happened and how our school became to be uh, what it is today, uh, detaching itself from the School of Engineering. Tom was part of that process and we have the luxury to, or we have the luxury to document that. Uh, but he's also intrigued in complexity. I quote, I'm not a distiller and I'm not very much of a modernist in the end. I like things to be very rich and complicated. I like it to be a big meal for your eyes. I also like the challenge of trying to pull off a complicated texture. There's the belief that surfaces lie, lie to you. Modernism is about getting beneath the surface because that's where the truth is. So you're always supposed to be scratching your way through the surface to get at what's underneath. What I do is a direct and deliberate contradiction. I think there's a monumental amount of truth in the surface. I think that's why I get into it so much and include so much of it in the composition. Some of these drawings are done with two H pencils, hard leads that require a tremendous amount of, of time and work. You know, the, the six Bs, the very thick, Pencils are rarely used, although sometimes they are used, but most of it, which I think it's impressive, somebody who attempts to draw uh, also at a different level, of course, um, you know, the 2H is a scary uh, pencil because it doesn't do much. So you really need to work and work and work over uh, a drawing to get meaning out of it with hard uh, leads. Um, it is the pretentious versus the everyday that probably comes out of out because of the place. He's talking about the gate. It's a gate. To the other side, there's a grocery store. There are ordinary, ordinary little houses with chain link fences around them. That's so much a natural and man-made sub subject. We have to uh, be reminded that Vincent Scully was an active uh, uh, intellect around our school and the natural, this juxtaposition of the natural and the man-made uh, will obviously resonate with those, those of us who read or attended his lectures. Um, uh, and, and Tom's work, it's oftentimes addressing this issue. Uh, but the fence is a, a, an homage of the, to the grocery store. And he's obsessed with texture, with, um, these uh, challenges that he sets for himself at the drafting uh, table. Uh, and of other references come to mind. He would regularly talk about Wyeth, Durer, the Dutch masters, you know, the, the ability to draw every hair in the rabbit or to draw every piece of the field, every leaf on the tree, every mark on the, every geological mark on the stone. Uh, it's undoubtedly relating his work to Wyeth. He would not even um, deny any of that. Actually, his, the work is in a, in a way uh, an academic endeavor using references that are, have been interesting to him. And the, the way that he has been able to pull it off, I think it's by adding uh, to these exquisite renditions meaning and perhaps not answers, but questions, you know, when we look at this uh, drawing, natural field slash water tower, again, this duality, the natural and the man-made, um, many interpretations could, could come about. Uh, what we wrote in the book is that, you know, perhaps what this drawing is trying to make us think is about the displacement of the natural landscape as the metropolitan area became developed. Um, I think the beauty of the work is that there's, there are many lines of uh, uh, thought, many ways of understanding the work. I think what great art could do for, for us is to 
confront us with questions that may allow us to think about our future, our past, our present. Uh, and indeed, uh, Tom's paintings and drawings do that. And this is a clear example uh, of, of that. I'm slowly wrapping up um, with another quote, you know, the deliberate homage to Caravaggio, uh, you know, he's referring to St. Matthew and the angel. Uh, you'll notice in his painting that uh, he has a, a knee on a stool that's tipped up and one leg is falling off a ledge. So Caravaggio will introduce very subtle anomalies, rotten pieces of fruit, broken violins. It took me a long time to notice. It took Tom a very long time to notice his subtle moves. Uh, but uh, what I think it's, it's worthwhile pointing out is that it, there's almost no randomness to the work. Uh, there's a great deal of individuality, a great deal of uh, uniqueness in the work, but uh, oftentimes we can draw very direct connections. And in this case, the tipping of the stool in San Mateo uh, here, I think it's quite uh, obvious. I'll be showing Tom's work in a second. And then Tom would say, Caravaggio in this painting has three moves. They're all to the left, like the uh, Granada entrance drawing. Uh, so these very unexpected compositions that uh, he's searching for. These are the preliminary studies for, for the landscape workers. Again, this uh, social, the social agenda issues come across because of the titles. Um, and we, need, we would need to be creative enough to think about them without knowing the title of the piece. But in this case, he's representing those who clean up the gardens in the very important gardens in Coral Gables who make the city beautiful every, every morning for us to enjoy, but they're not part of the frame. Uh, and the ladder is either falling down or it's not you know, properly located there. And I think um, to conclude this, this brief presentation, I would like to maybe show two more slides that are in the book because we had the opportunity to heavily discuss with Tom why he was inclined to, to Caravaggio that could be found in the book. And the fact that he was never welcomed in the, in the circles in Rome back then uh, made him uh, an odd figure drawn to show, uh, to, to represent musicians rather than nobility. Uh, and I think besides the compositional uh, strategies, all the, uh, the talent that one could not aspire to uh, perform, you know, it's a, a gift uh, that he has, that he claims is 95% hard work, uh, which I can imagine and agree to, but the talent is there. And I think the other agenda, which is to, to, to celebrate the mundane uh, reality in a way. So, um, that's Tom in his studio, and I think he's joining us today. We wanted to uh, end uh, before the hour so we can open up the floor for questions. And hopefully, if Tom is still here, he could uh, uh, answer some of those if you would like. But thank you for your time and attention.